Hello and welcome to Talking Tudors, a fortnightly podcast about the ever-fascinating Tudor dynasty. My name is Natalie Gruniger and I'll be your host and guide on this journey through 16th century England. Are you ready to step through the veil of time into the dazzling and dangerous world of the Tudor court? Without further ado, it's time to talk Tudors. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Talking Tudors. I'm your host, Natalie Gruniger. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'd like to begin by sharing a little bit of exciting news. As some of you may be aware, Sarah Morris, the Tudor Travel Guide, and Adam Pennington from the Tudor Chest have recently started a new tour company called Simply Tudor Tours. I was very honoured to be invited to accompany their first tour, The Rise and Fall of Anne Boleyn, which will run from the 2nd to the 8th of September 2024. If you'd like to spend six days with me exploring historic sites associated with Anne Boleyn and talking a lot of Tudors, do check out their website for details. They've organised a truly amazing itinerary for guests, one that will absolutely blow the socks off any Anne Boleyn lover. There are, however, only a few places left, so do be quick. Find out more and book your place at simplytudortours.com. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the generous listeners who continue to support Talking Tudors on Patreon and extend a heartfelt thank you to everyone who's taken the time to rate and review the show. This really does make a difference. If you love the podcast and you never miss an episode, I invite you to join the Talking Tudors Patreon family. Please visit patreon.com slash Talking Tudors for more information. Join the Talking Tudors family to instantly unlock access to exclusive posts, including audio releases and videos. Patrons are also eligible to attend additional monthly live talks and to take part in member-only book clubs and enter patron-only monthly giveaways to name but a few of the perks. You can also support the podcast and share your love of Tudor history with the world by buying Talking Tudors merchandise. There are a number of designs and products available, including phone cases, mugs, notebooks and apparel. Check out all the products at talkingtudors.threadless.com. Now, on to today's episode. I'm thrilled to welcome Bethan Watts to the show to talk about daily life in Tudor England. Bethan is a historian specialising in the social and domestic history of the English Middle Ages and the early modern period. She's particularly interested in the history of children and childhood, health and hygiene, and the household. Bethan has a first-class distinction in both BA and MA Medieval Studies from the University of Wales. She's currently studying for a PhD and is writing her thesis on the lives of infants, toddlers, and young children in late medieval England. As well as the Middle Ages, Bethan also enjoys researching and writing about Tudor England. She's the author of Inside the Tudor Home, Daily Life in the 16th Century. She's currently writing her second book on life in Victorian London. Let's dive straight into our conversation. So welcome to Talking Tudors, Bethan. How are you? Thank you, Natalie. I'm good, thank you. It's lovely to have you on the show. And I suppose a good place to start is you just introducing yourself to our listeners and just telling us a little bit about you and your background. So I'm a medieval and early uh, modern historian. I specialise in social history, especially history of the home and history of people. So families and children, especially. Um, I'm currently writing my PhD thesis at the moment on young children and the world around them in late medieval and early modern England. Um, so I love researching the history of, you know, families as a whole and also things like health and hygiene and how people approach things like that, as well as things like death and dying within kind of domestic environments. Well, it all sounds absolutely fascinating. We are here today to talk about your your new book, which is very exciting, which is called Inside the Tudor Home, Daily Life in the 16th Century. So what was the inspiration behind this particular work? 
Well, as I said, I'm a social historian, so I've always been drawn to the history of people. Um, and the history of the home is a particular love of mine. I've written quite a few academic papers about, you know, things within the home. So hygiene within the home and death within the home. You know, even things like how people bathed, what they ate, how they dressed, and just things along that line. Um, the Tudor era has always been a passion of mine as well. And I've spent a lot of my career so far researching the Tudors and the social history of early modern Britain as a whole. But I've also, I've loved the history of the Tudors, you know, from Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII, you know, all the, the key figures. Um, but I think for me, me, the people who I find most interesting are the everyday people, the people like you and me who would have perhaps lived in quite simple homes, had quite simple jobs. And I just think their stories are sometimes more important than other you know, figures of the time. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought before we dive into the sort of nitty gritty of, of daily life in Tudor England, which is so fascinating, and I think people are really interested to hear about how, you know, people did everyday things. I'd love if you could just set the scene for us a little bit. Just tell us a little bit about what England was actually like in the 16th century. So I think we have to remember that England, it was the scene of two halves. You had the rich at the very upper levels of society, and then you had the very poor. So this came about from something called the feudal system, which existed in medieval England. And it was kind of like a tier, like a pyramid scheme, where at the very top of the pyramid, you'd have the king, and then underneath him, you'd have the aristocracy, you'd have the clergy, the church, and then underneath him, um, you'd have merchants and the richer people of society. And then right at the bottom, you'd have the peasants the very poor people who just, you know, made the bulk of society of the time. You've also got to remember that Tudor England was a lot greener than it is today. There were a lot more forests, there were a lot more hunting grounds, there were a lot more open spaces where modern buildings now stand today. But you've also got to remember as well that houses were much further apart in the Tudor times. They didn't live as closely as we do today. They didn't live, okay, yes, they lived in villages, they lived in towns, but they weren't as dense as they are today. And let's stick with the topic of, of houses for the moment. So if we were traveling around Tudor England, what kinds of houses might we encounter? The houses in Tudor England were as varied as they are today. So you would have some nicer houses where you would have, you know, richer people perhaps living in them. Um, but then you would also have some houses that were almost hovels of the poor. So they could be wattle and daub cottages, which were kind of frames, wooden frames that would be put together with like a plaster kind of substance. Um, not particularly sturdy, but they were affordable for the, the poor. But then slowly graduating up the, the wealth system, I suppose, you'd have stone houses, brick houses, and then as you further graduate up to the higher echelons, you'd have things like jettied townhouses with numerous floors and you'd have single room dwellings. So I think to describe the Tudor home is impossible in a way because there was no such one sing single Tudor home. And in terms of diversity, because in your book, you actually talk about mm -hmm. the fact that Tudor England was a country just as diverse as, as it is as England is today. So talk to us a little bit about this diversity. So I think we have to remember that places like London, Bristol, Norwich, they were all very significant trading ports in the 16th century. And you would get lots of travellers, you would get lots of merchants from overseas landing in the country, and some of them stayed in the country. So you do get quite a few black communities, you do get quite a few Asian communities and populations who do settle and they do establish families within Tudor England. I think there's this common belief that maybe there wasn't a lot of black people in 16th century society. There wasn't a lot of, you know, diversity, but actually there was. And if you look at the records of the time, you do find that there are pockets of, you know, perhaps European communities, Polish communities, for example. You do find Germans, you find Spaniards, you find Italians. And even with 
you know, the introduction of people like Catherine of Aragon and Anne of Cleves to the country, they brought a very large retinue from their countries. So there are numerous references of people associated with them kind of settling in England at the time, as well as things like, you know, Flemish envoys, Venetian envoys who do visit England and who do choose to stay. Now, let's go back to the home for a moment and talk a little bit about some of those uh, nitty gritty things that people like to know about. So in terms of cleaning Mm -hmm. houses, how did the ordinary, and maybe we'll just stick to kind of ordinary people, how did the ordinary people actually keep their homes clean? I loved researching this because I've got such an interest in health and hygiene and sanitation from that period. I I found this so interesting Um, and I loved really breaking down the myth that the Tudors were unclean and that they were unsanitary because they weren't at all. You know, the Tudors did laundry, they washed their dishes, they changed their beds, they swept their floors just as we do today. And I think we have to remember that these people lived in houses just as we do. They wouldn't want to live in dirty surroundings just like we wouldn't today. So they would clean, they would maintain a a level of of cleanliness within their homes. Um, In terms of things like products and stuff, obviously they don't have commercial products that we do today. So a lot of the cleaning products and things from the time were naturally derived. So things like fruit, um, lemon pops up quite a few times. You'd find a lot of floral um, ingredients like lavender, for example, is one of them. And you'd even find things like salt and sand, which would be used to scour dishes, for example, um, which is very interesting because I never considered something like that. And, you know, even things like lawn daily tasks in the 16th century, it was a backbreaking task in the 16th century. And they, women, I should say, would do this pretty much every day just to make sure that their houses were clean. They did have things like soap that would be derived from vegetable oils or animal fats. Um, And they did create suds and they were effective. I think people forget that they were effective and they did also smell nice. I know obviously we can't go back in time to smell them and some of them probably didn't smell nice, but things like soap, for example, would be added to with you know, scents that we would recognise today, like yes. lemon, lavender. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that people are always interested in, in the bathing process as well. And I know probably mm-hmm. the ordinary person wouldn't be able to immerse themselves in water too often, but they definitely did um, do a sort of clean daily, didn't they? Whether that be with a cloth or, or something like that. Yeah. So Ruth Goodman, the historian, wrote a really interesting book called How to Be Tudor. And she outlined this Thing which I never considered before, where the Tudors, like you said, if they couldn't immerse themselves in water, they would use cloths to rub their bodies down. And according to Ruth Goodman, this is supposed to be just as effective as washing. It would kind of get rid of all the oils, all the sweat and everything from your body and would apparently be quite nice smelling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it'd be like a body scrub today or something something yeah. akin to that, I think. Um, and, and obviously there were also a lot of household manuals, weren't there? So if you, you know, needed a recipe for soap or, or whatever it was, you could turn to one of these, couldn't you, if you had access to one? Definitely. Um, as a medieval historian, I do find a lot of these things in existence from quite early on um, in history, which I think people forget. You know, these kind of manuals have been around since the ancient times where They would recommend things like bathing or they would recommend rubbing your body down or washing your hair. And yeah, the Tudors were a lot cleaner than we think. And did you find that the people at the time understood the link between sanitation and health at all? I think so. Like going back to what I said about the Tudors being just like us, they wouldn't want to live in dirt. They wouldn't want to live, you know, smelling badly Um, and I think that they understood that being unclean could lead to things like disease and infection Um, so the Tudors had this of bad miasmas where the concept was you'd have a, a bad smell and it could lead to you know horrible diseases and actually they weren't that far off when you think okay bacteria and germ theory didn't come around until the 19th century but the Tudors did recognize that things that produced bad smells could cause diseases and could cause illnesses. So you do find that 
the Tudors were aware that things like dirty fingernails could result in infection, you know, when they're performing, I don't know, operations on each other and all those things. Um, And there are stories of newborn babies, especially, that are washed immediately after their birth. And the midwives and the mothers as well are washed um, while they're performing like labour and deliveries to prevent infections. I also think as well in times of the plague and in times of the sweating sickness, there was this awareness that, you know, okay, they had mass graves, but these graves would be set away from dwellings. They would be set away from water sources. Because the Tudors were aware that, you know, to have those in close proximity to you, those corpses, could result in the spread of disease. Yeah, they suddenly had a lot to contend with, didn't they, with all those terrible diseases like the sweating sickness that you've mentioned. But what other dangers might one encounter, perhaps just in the home? What are some of the things you had to look out for? When I was researching this chapter of the book, I didn't realise just how dangerous the Tudor home could actually be. I think today we take for granted how safe our homes are. But for the Tudors, like you said, they had to contend with these things daily. They had to worry about things like weather. So, for example, like the weather could cause flooding, could cause, you know, heavy winds, for example, could knock walls down. And there is a source from the time where someone's wattle and daub cottage walls completely collapsed because of the rain and the winds. And we have to remember that back then they didn't have building regulations that we have today. So they would have materials that perhaps weren't up to scratch, they weren't up to standards. So walls would collapse, ceilings would collapse, door frames would collapse, and they could land on people, you know, beneath. Then within the home, you'd have things like the fireplace. Fireplaces were a relatively modern invention in the 16th century, and they revolutionised the way that people lived in Tudor England. But fireplaces could be dangerous and chimneys could be dangerous. So although they awarded the Tudors with warmth and heat, they also could cause things like carbon monoxide poisoning if you know the smoke wasn't correctly drawn from the house. Susanna Lipscomb did a really interesting documentary about this a few years ago, and I spoke to Susanna about this. And she told me about how you know the chimney, if it wasn't constructed correctly, could cause a backlog of things like smoke and whatever, which could you know come back into the home and could cause things like carbon monoxide poisoning. It could also cause house fires. You have to remember that a lot of the cottages of the time, and you can even see pictures of them today, of Tudor houses had thatched um, thatched roofs. So you would find sometimes these roofs would catch on fire or they would, just a tiny spark could catch them alight. You'd also find that with fireplaces especially, there are some horrible references to people or children especially walking into them and catching fire and so the clothes of adults for example could catch a light and as as a childhood historian I've researched quite a few horrible references to to child deaths within the home where babies have fallen into the flames and they have just walked into the fires because they haven't been protected as well as that you would find babies as well falling into water bus which is something that we don't consider today. But water butts and open sources of water where the Tudors would have derived their water from would or could pose to be dangerous for children and adults alike who would fall into these things, you know, these rivers, these streams, and they would become waterlogged and they could drown. But as well as that, you'd also find things like staircases could be very dangerously built. You know, perhaps the materials that they were built with weren't strong enough, weren't sturdy enough. And you do find staircases collapsing or you do find, you know, other structural parts of the building collapsing. And as well as that, you find animals as well wandering into the home. So going back to this point of children dying in the home. Unfortunately, that was a common theme that I found when I was researching the book. That, you know, something like an animal, like a pig, for example, could wander into the home and harm a child, perhaps take a bite out of a child as it slept in its crib. So there were a lot of dangers within the home that we wouldn't necessarily think of today. 
Now, maybe just to lighten the mood a little bit. So how about we talk a little bit about popular forms of recreation and entertainment? Because, of course, it wasn't all just working, although for most people it was hard work. What, what did the sort of ordinary people like to do to relax a little bit and unwind? So I've always assumed that it was only kind of the richer echelons of society that could read, which, yes, OK, you know, they were literate. And you do find that a lot of 16th century peasants were illiterate, so they couldn't read. However, that doesn't mean that they wouldn't enjoy stories and storytelling. So, for example, you do find references of people crowding around in groups, listening to stories where, you know, somebody like a church man like a priest for example could read out a story and they could all enjoy it with them um you do find things like stained glass windows for example telling stories so that the illiterate people could appreciate them just as people who could read um as well as that you do find that a lot of tudors would play instruments musical instruments um even if they were makeshift ones that they had constructed themselves you know little drums or little flutes you do find children especially playing a range of games that I think even children today would probably recognise. You know, they would play with hoops, for example. They would, they would dance. They would play hopscotch. They would play leapfrog. And all of these lovely stories of children playing games of the time. You would also find, as I said, things like dancing. I think the Tudors had a particular affinity for music, just as we do today. They did enjoy getting together. They did enjoy dancing. They did enjoy, you know, spending time with their families and celebrating and just having a good old party, I think. Yes, and, and I, I thought we could just return briefly just to what you were talking about earlier about um, your interest in, in sort of attitudes toward death and dying at the time mm -hmm. and life expectancy because you often hear sometimes contradictory information about life expectancy in the 16th century. So I think we've got this association with the Tudor times that people died relatively young. So, okay, yes, you do find a lot of references to people dying when they're in their 40s or earlier. Um, but I think on the whole, we underestimate just how long some Tudors actually lived for. So there are references, you know, Queen Elizabeth I, for example, lived until she was in her 60s. Um, and I know she was a bit of an outlier. You could say, well, perhaps her wealth contributed to that and she had the best health care and all of that sort of stuff. But you do find references as well to lesser members of society who do live until they're 70, who do live until they're 80 even. I think the mortality rates of the time are brought down considerably from the infant mortality rates, if that makes sense. So because there was such a high number of children who would die before perhaps they'd reach the age of 10, that would bring down the rest of mortality rates in Tudor England and make it seem as a whole that Tudor society was quite young when they died. But I don't think that's often the case. Going back to the diversity point earlier, you would find children, you would find older people in society as well, in Tudor society. Attitudes to death and dying are very much the same as they are today, which surprised me. I always thought that perhaps the Tudors, not that they wouldn't care, but perhaps they just thought that death was the end, which wasn't the case at all. You find that the Tudors made provisions for the dead, even if that was, you know, preparing for their burials or preparing for their funerals. And you even find things like peasants, for example, would request that their family members would be, their names would be written in books in churches at the time so that every mass, you know, for example, every Sunday, um, their names would be read out and their souls in heaven, as they, you know, believed, could reach salvation. And there was this huge belief in the 16th century of the afterlife where, you know, you did have this idea of heaven, hell and purgatory. And the Tudors wanted to have as as good as death as they possibly could because they aimed to reach the afterlife. And you obviously spent, you know, quite a lot of time immersed in this period while writing your book and throughout your career. What's something that you encountered that really surprised you during your research? I think what surprised me the most, and this, this probably won't seem very interesting, but when I was researching about animals within the home. As I said earlier, I always assumed that the only animals the Tudors would own within their homes were things like farm animals. 
perhaps if they kept chickens or cows. But actually, I was really pleasantly surprised to find that so many of them kept pets just for fun. They had dogs, they had cats, just as we do today. And they loved them and they saw them as an extension of their families, just as we do today. So you do find, you know, some key figures like Cardinal Wolsey, for example, had a cat. But you also find other members of society on a lesser scale would keep pets as well. To some extent, for example, a cat could be used to catch rats within the home. And you could say that they had a practical use within the home. But I also think as well that the Tudors truly loved their animals. And they truly loved them as an extension of their families, just like we do today. That is really interesting. You know, I have come across a lot of the aristocracy and nobility, of course, having having pets and the women having lap dogs and that sort of thing. But mm-hmm. it's really interesting to see that it that it did go down the sort of scale as well. So that's really fascinating. And the last question, Beth, and I have for you is about a common myth. So what do you think is one of the most common myths that you've come across about life in Tudor England? I've got quite a few. I think, for example, a lot of people think that the Tudor society as a whole were unclean. You know, even the very richest people of society were unclean. They didn't wash, which wasn't the case at all. You do find, you know, from the very richest, the kings and the queens, to the very poorest, people did stay clean. They did stay, you know, as as clean as they could with all things considering at the time. I think there's also a common myth that the Tudors were unloving and that they could be cold sometimes to their families. In cases of children, for example, dying, going back to the point of mortality, I think because so many children died back with them to die, I think there's this common belief that Tudor parents sort of didn't grow attached to their families, which isn't the case at all. And you do find so many references to parents grieving their children and loving their children, just as we do today. So the Tudors were very familial and very attached to their families, not only their closest relatives, so their their children, but also their distant relatives as well. And you do find a lot of networks between cousins, for example, or between uncles, which is really lovely to read. I think as well, we believe the Tudors, like you said, were just constantly working, that they didn't have leisurely activities, they didn't have pursuits that they enjoyed, hobbies that they enjoyed, but that wasn't the case at all. They did engage in recreational activities, they did engage in sports, they engaged in music, and they had fun just like we do today. They d- Okay, yes, they worked a lot. Um, especially the poor, but they did have a work-life balance in a sense where they could also enjoy themselves away from work and away from their labour. Yeah, all such great points. And I'm so glad you brought up the one about the grief because I have come across that one myself so many times, in particular uh, associated with the parents that are noble parents or even royal parents because of the many times their children are raised by other people. There's this idea that there's no love there, which I think is a myth. Absolutely, completely agree with you. So um, so there's one more thing. Well, there's actually two more things we do on episodes of Talking <laughs> Tutors. So we have a little game of 10 to go, which is just 10 quick questions just to get to know you a little bit better. So the first one is, what is a new skill that you might like to learn? In terms of history or just in, just in anything, general? Just anything in general. I would love to learn a new language. I've always wanted to speak French ever since I was young. I've always loved this idea of being able to speak French. I can't speak French, <laughs> but I would love to be able to learn a new language <laughs> Absolutely. if I could. Yeah, languages are fantastic. And what about the last book that you read or perhaps one that you're currently reading? So I'm currently reading a book about Henry VIII's children, which I think is quite apt, actually, considering our conversation. It's by Alison Weir, um, who's written quite a lot about the subject. It's called Children of England, and it's about the heirs of Henry VIII. So it does talk about his natural children, but it also talks about Lady Jane Grey, who was uh, the granddaughter of Henry's sister, Mary. So it's it's very interesting. It's a very good book. I'd recommend. Wonderful. And what do you yourself like to do to relax and unwind a little bit? I'm one of these people who can't sit still. I have to have so many things on the go. I've got so many different hobbies. <laughs> I think reading and writing is probably my passion. But I love to I love to do cross stitch. I love to embroider. 
I love doing crafty things like painting and all that sort of stuff as well. Um, I love to cook. I'm not very good at it sometimes, <laughs> um, but I do enjoy cooking and just kind of domestic things like that. Wonderful. And do you have a signature recipe that you're known for? I suppose when I was at university, um, I would cook a lot of spaghetti bolognese. <laughs> Yum, I love um, it. My friends... My friends and I would kind of share the spaghetti bolognese. And I, I think that was probably my signature dish. Absolutely. It's good comfort food. You can never say no to a good spag bowl. And, and do you have any pets at all? I don't. I did used to have cats, but they aren't with us anymore, unfortunately. Um, but they lived to very good ages. Their names were Lolly and Cookie. Oh, um, that's gorgeous. Both that's females. <laughs> but yeah, they're not with us anymore. But hopefully soon I might get another one. <laughs> oh, wonderful. That's exciting. And what about the last film or if not a film, maybe a series that you watched? The BBC have been showing Interview with a Vampire. Oh, yes. Um, it, it's the TV series. They've they've redone this TV series and it's really, really good. Um, I definitely recommend. I'm not really into like horror no. things usually, but it's it's a very good show and I'd recommend people to watch it. I haven't actually seen the series. I, I've seen the films, but not not the series. So that's that's good. I might need to look that one up. Um, and and is there a mystery that you would love to know the answer to? And this doesn't have to be an historical mystery at all. It could be something more contemporary. But is is there something that you'd really love to know the answer to? I think lots of things, lots of different mysteries. I was actually I was talking to someone the other day about time travel and the possibility of time travel. And there's one mystery and example of a man who supposedly came back um, in time and he was from like the 1950s or something. And I would just love to kind of know more about things like the possibility of time travel and if that actually exists and could we ever do it ourselves? Yeah, that is fascinating. I'm a, I'm a big fan of time slip stories. So I'm always like looking for new yeah. time slip stories. They're wonderful. And last question for you. Do you happen to have a favorite artwork, whether it may be a 16th century artwork? I know lots of us love those Tudor paintings. Do you have one that you that you really enjoy? There is um, a particular favorite of mine. So as a social historian, I focus a lot on the histories of childhood. And one painting that I've come across is by Peter Bruegel, I think is how you pronounce it. Um, and it's called Children's Games. And it's a huge, huge painting where there's lots of different children depicted playing different games. And I think that's something like 150 or something different games um, wow. depicted within it. And I, I just love it. I love looking at the painting and pointing out all the different people. It's, it's, it's a very good painting. Yes, I think I know the one you mean, but I'm going to go and have a look at it again after this because I didn't realise there were so many games depicted. That's amazing. <laughs> And the very last thing is for our Tudor takeaway. So I ask all my guests for something for our listeners to go off and explore after the episode. So do you have a takeaway for us? When I was doing the research for this book, I relied quite a lot on archival sources, but archival sources that have been digitised. So I started writing this book during the pandemic where we couldn't leave our homes. We couldn't go to museums and things. So things like the British Library the Bodleian Library. They digitised a lot of their manuscripts, um, their Tudor manuscripts, Tudor books of hours. Um, and I would probably recommend something like that. You know, you can access them from the comfort of your own home. They're entirely free. And the images that you see are so high definition. You can literally see every single detail. Absolutely. I often lose myself for hours in um, digitized manuscripts. I recently spent a long time looking at a music manuscript that had some beautiful illuminations. So, you know, I think mm -hmm. I was you know, lost for about an hour there. So that's a wonderful takeaway. And I have to thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast and talk to us with us. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of Talking Tudors. Thank you so much for joining us. I absolutely love to hear from listeners, so if you have any comments or suggestions or just want to say hi, please get in touch with me via my website, www.onthetudortrail.com, where you'll also find show notes for today's episode. If you've enjoyed the show, please share the podcast with friends and family, and don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. I also invite you to join our Talking Tudors podcast group on Facebook, where you can interact with other Tudor history lovers and hear all 
all the behind the scenes news you'll also find me on twitter my handle is on the tudor trail and on instagram as the most happy 78 it's time now for us to re-enter the modern world as always i look forward to talking tudors with you again very soon mm -hmm.